Today we're going to be continuing our discussion of deep learning models, but today we're not going to talk about models that only give you a single output. We're going to be talking about sequence models, similar to what we talked about before for discriminative learning, but, but now we're going to allow the representations to be discovered by the algorithms and not just use features that we've encoded ourselves. As a motivation for why we're talking about sequence models, let's talk about language models, which is an application in natural language processing. Language models allow you to score whether a particular sentence looks like it should be a sentence in English, for example, or German, or Chinese, or whatever your favorite language is. And this is important for applications like predicting the next word that you're going to say on, for example, your phone. It's also useful for things like machine translation. And so machine translation may give you uh, multiple outputs as possible translations for a phrase. And you might prefer to say, I'm going home, rather than I'm going house. It can also help you with word order. And so oftentimes languages have very different word order, so when you're translating from one language into another, you want to know which words should come in what order. But the obvious thing of just taking a single sentence and then saying, is this a good sentence or not, is nearly impossible. We can create an infinite number of perfectly reasonable English sentences, and you can understand what they mean and realize that they're good English sentences. So we can't just look at things at the level of a whole sentence. And so what traditionally was done in natural language processing is to break up sentences into individual chunks. And uh, these are often called engrams, and then you count up how often you see those engrams in a corpus, and then you can get a score by scoring each of the individual engrams. And these counts can be very, very large. So if you look at all possible combinations of two or three or four or five word sequences that appear in, say, all of the internet, you can end up with a very, very large number of counts, and this can be really expensive in terms of memory. But this was state-of-the-art until about 2010. The alternative that we're going to be talking about today is a class of sequence models that will get more and more complex. So the first sequence model that we'll talk about is called a recurrent neural network. So at each time step, you have your input. This is your observed word. And so if your sequence of words is the small house, then uh, at each input time step, you have the vector representation of the word, and uh, this is going to be learned by the recurrent neural network, but you can initialize this by things like word to vec or things like that. And then that gets fed into a hidden layer, and that hidden layer is supposed to represent the current state of the sentence or the sequence, and from that hidden layer, you're going to make a prediction. And this prediction could be anything you want, but if we're talking about language models, then this is going to be something like the next word. And then for the next time step, you take the previous hidden state and combine it with your current word to get a new representation of your hidden layer, and then you again make your prediction of what the next word is going to be. But this could be more than just the next word. You could also use this for tagging the sentence with part of speech or any other sort of task that you might want to do. So let's take a more careful look at the parameterization of the recurrent neural network. And so at each time step, you're going to have a representation of the hidden state. And that is a function of both the previous hidden state and the word input that you're getting at this time step. You combine those two inputs together using some weight matrix, and then pass it through a nonlinearity to get your new hidden state. And of course, these are all vectors. The hidden state is a vector, the previous hidden state is a vector, and the word representation is a vector. All of this is in the dimensionality of the representation that you've chosen for your recurrent neural network. And then your y hat is the prediction that you're going to make. This is obviously task dependent, but if we're doing language modeling, so this takes your hidden state, multiplies it by some parameter w, and then you can think of this as a distribution over your words, 
And your prediction for what the next word is going to be is that distribution over words. So this is a really clever idea, and it's been very popular and successful, but it has a reputation for being tricky to train. And you can get a sense of why this is if you think about the structure of this network. So you can have very long sentences in just about every language. And so you're going to be multiplying the same matrix over and over again. And think about how this affects backpropagation. And so at every time step, you're going to be getting an error signal from the prediction that you should have been making. Given your true answer that you should have been predicting, uh, your y, at say t plus 1, that sends an error signal back to your hidden state of this time step and your current word representation of this time step. But that's not all. Remember, because there is this recurrence in the recurrent neural network, hence the name, we're going to be combining the current hidden state with the previous hidden state. So the current hidden state is an interpolation passed through a softmax of the previous hidden state and the word representation. So that means when we do the chain rule, we're going to have to backpropagate the error from yt plus 1 to the previous hidden state as well, and also the previous word representation. But that hidden state is an interpolation of the previous hidden state and the word representation passed through a nonlinearity. So we have to backcrop one previous time step as well. And so depending on what the values of our matrix are, we can end up with very, very small values or very, very large values. So we won't go through the proof of this, uh, but hopefully you can see why it's intuitively true. The size of the partial derivatives are going to depend on how big your W and H matrices are. The size of your partial derivative is going to match those norms, and this is going to be exponentially large based on the size of your sequence. And so thus, your norm can get very large or very small, depending on how big the norms are. And both of these are problems. If the norms are too big, then stochastic gradient descent doesn't work anymore. If the norms are too small, you're not going to make progress in learning. For example, you can have long-range dependencies in sentences, and this is the sort of thing that recurrent neural networks can learn. So if you have the sentence, Jane walked into the room, John walked in too, it was late in the day, Jane said hi to blank, and you want your language model to predict what the next word is going to be, you need to go back and realize that it's Jane. But for the model to learn how to do that, the error signal needs to get back from this time step all the way to the first occurrence of Jane. So you can do something very simple to solve the exploding gradient problem. And so basically set a threshold. And if the gradient gets above that threshold, just cap the gradient at that threshold. And there's a nice analysis uh, from uh, Pascanau et al., uh, 2013, that shows how this happens. And so in the case where you don't do gradient clipping, stochastic gradient descent can send you on crazy trajectories in your parameter space. So here we have w and here we have b, and you have this huge jump in the parameter space. But if you do gradient clipping, then you end up on a much saner trajectory that your model can actually learn in. And if your gradients are too small, one thing that helps a lot is using the rectified linear unit activation function, and this is a nonlinearity that simply is zero when you have a small input and then linear after that. So this is a very simple activation function, and if you initialize your w's to the identity matrix, both of these things together go a long way to helping prevent vanishing gradients. So to recap, we briefly introduced the recurrent neural network, a model for capturing the sequence of things like sentences or anything that unfolds over time. This could be action sequences uh, in a video animation, this could be annotating 
whether regions are coding or non-coding regions in a genome. So anything where you have a sequence that could be time or something that you can place one after the other, that makes logical sense. But one question that you may be asking yourself is, the recurrent neural network remembers everything, so it doesn't forget anything. And you have these very long gradient chains as a result. Do we actually need this? Might it be possible for our models to do better if they could actually start over and ignore the previous hidden state? And that's what we're going to be talking about next.